Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with me, Scott Maslinski. In this podcast, we dive deep into questions around zero carb, meat based nutrition through interviews with doctors, research experts, zero carb veterans, and case studies from real people. This episode will be a little different than the normal affair. This will be a solo cast where I cover my latest diet, experiments, thinking on carnivore topics such as weight loss, nose to tail carnivore, and more. I'd love to know what you think, so please message me on social media at CarnivoreCast across Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. Please consider supporting the show on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash CarnivoreCast to help us reach more people and continue to produce content on the carnivore diet. There are also exclusive perks available, such as Q&As, private consultations with me, and more. If you don't use Patreon, you can also support us at paypal.me slash carnivorecast. Thank you very much. So in this episode, I want to cover a variety of topics um, that I've been asked about lately or learning about. And uh, hopefully this is informative for others. And I'll start with kind of an overview and my thinking and how it's evolved, as well as some sources I've used to learn more about these topics and where folks can go if they want to dig in. But I'll also get to some practical takeaways and how it's actually impacted me. So the first topic I want to cover is nose to tail carnivore. And this is an argument that has been presented by folks like Dr. Paul Saladino and even prior to him becoming more prominent, um, Frank Tufano was talking about this a lot with kind of an ancestral nutrient-based approach to carnivore. Um, Whereas a lot of people will say, you know, carnivore is just about eating only meat. Um, You don't necessarily need organs. Some people don't prefer organs, and that's just fine. Um, Just focusing on uh, meat is going to get you 99% of the results you need. Paul Saladino and Frank Tufano would say that's nutritionally incomplete. We uh, didn't evolve eating only muscle meat, and um, there are vitamins that are not very available in muscle meat, such as vitamin A and folate and choline. There are also issues they talk about, such as the um, high amount of methionine in meat and how you need to balance a glycine to methionine ratio. Frank says this is less of a big deal if you're eating a high-fat diet, um, but Paul Saladino definitely stresses this a lot and cites certain rat studies where there was a higher rates of mortality and um, developing uh, cancer, I believe, if you had um, very high methionine ratios. And by eating only the muscle meat, you might be eating a higher methionine ratio than you otherwise would if you're eating more nose to tail. So a few issues I kind of have with this argument and where I kind of fall down on, on the issue is One, the only studies on glycine to methionine ratio have been done in rats. And rats uh, may not be fully carnivorous. Their diet and their bodies are highly different than than people. And we have long-term carnivores like the Andersons, like Charles Washington, lots of folks who don't touch organ meats at all. Um, Dana from Zero Carb Health, many others. So I I find it hard to believe that we really need um, to be adding collagen powder, glycine powder to our steaks. And, you know, Dr. Paul Saladino talked me into it uh, when I had him on the podcast. And folks should definitely go listen to that show. It's a really in-depth um, show if they're, they're interested to learn more about this. But I think, you know, it's great to try to eat more cuts that have tendons and um, to try to occasionally have some bone broth. I, but I really don't think it's necessary. And um, I just really don't think it requires the level of science and preciseness of making sure you're getting exactly 10 grams of collagen or glycine for uh, every 100 grams of, of protein you get from muscle meat. Another thing they bring up is omega-3 ratios and salmon roe and the importance of making sure you're including omega-3s um, and, and saying that salmon roe is really the only great source of these nutrients and highly bioavailable. You know, they say wild 
fish and wild salmon um, and also fish oil is so likely to be toxic and oxidized um, and also doesn't contain um, certain types of omega-3 lipids that are available in the salmon row. So I think all of this kind of comes down to uh, being a little bit too focused on nutrient density. And part of the problem with when you're measuring nutrient density in this way, which is based on RDAs, recommended daily allowances of certain nutrients, a lot of those are based on um, poor science, incomplete science, or um, and in the context of a high carbohydrate diet. So um, let me be a little bit more specific. Uh, a lot of these recommendations that come forward about how much vitamin C we should have, how much vitamin A we need, how much magnesium we need, are based on First of all, the outliers in a given population, so the people who start showing symptoms first, you might have a group of 100 people, you give them all different amounts of vitamin C, and the people who start to do bad on the lowest possible dose of vitamin C, that's where they set the RDA. So it's really uh, the like worst case hazard ratio type of deal. Also, those people... We we have evidence to show, and and jo Dr. Georgia Ede and Amber O'Hearn, um, folks can check out their talks on YouTube. They've done some great breakdowns of this. That when you're consuming carbohydrates, that can often um, actually block absorption and inhibit absorption of certain nutrients like magnesium and zinc um, and vitamin C, and increase your body's requirement for some of these nutrients. So by applying those directly to a carnivorous diet and say we need X amount of vitamin A, X amount of folate, it, sh it just seems falsely precise. And it seems like we're using this data of nutrients in given foods that applies to a multivitamin and may apply to a high carbohydrate standard American diet, but just may be so far extrapolated when it comes to a carnivorous diet that's absent many of the foods um, that a lot of people are eating. And uh, my my good friend and uh, someone I consult on a lot of these things, Zach Moore, um, made an excellent point um, on some a recent Instagram post um, that Sean Baker made. And I think Sean, you know, displays this beautifully and walks a fine line by saying, you know, he and and Dr. Paul Saladino are on the same pay, on the same team, trying to get people to eat animal based foods, and I think Frank would say the same thing. Um, they just slightly differ in their opinion on on how much you need to include things like uh, glycine and and uh, bone meal and um, certain organs. But he showed a picture of you know four zero carb veterans saying that none of them eat organ meats and none of them worry about glycine to methionine ratios or add collagen to their steaks. And Zach commented with, a, I just thought it was such an insightful comment that it's becoming a contest, this nutrient density thing. And it's the problem when you track something and apply data to something like people checking the scale weight every day, you just become obsessive and either people become obsessive with something to the point where there it becomes a contest of of who can get the most folate, who can optimize all their nutrients on one day. And then what that does is the other half of people who don't become obsessive, they just get turned off. They get turned away. And that makes me sad because there's so many people that this diet can help. Even a simple version of this diet that's just eat meat and is really that simple that when you're making it more precise and more exact and saying that that's a requirement, it can really um, inhibit the adoption of a carnivore diet and the ability of that to heal as many people as possible, which is really my goal in all of this. So overall, I just say the nose to tail carnivore approach, I think it's well intended. It may be correct even, it may be totally right, but it seems like it's, it's, implying that we as humans are way too fragile. And I think we're really more resilient than needing to perfectly balance our glycine to methionine ratios and make sure we add just the right amount of, you know, collagen to our steaks. I can't imagine our ancestors were saying, oh, no, 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 no. I can't have another piece of the ribeye cut of this 
um, this giant mammoth we just killed. I really need to make sure I'm getting more of the glycine from the organs. Sorry, guys. Scoot over. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me logically. I know it's simple and reductionist, but that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. So what have I done? I'm increasing my liver consumption. So I know that goes against everything I just said, but I like liver. I like the way it makes me feel. It makes my brain buzz. And I feel like I can add liver once a week, once every other week without making a huge change to my lifestyle or my budget, um, frankly. And um, it, it doesn't seem to have a downside. So it's kind of like an insurance policy. So I'm having about half a pound of liver per week. I have it mostly raw from frozen. And what I'll do is I'll defrost a liver, cut it up into small pieces, put it in a Tupperware and put it in the freezer. And then I can just defrost the right amount I want or eat it straight from raw or throw it in the pan and just sear it for five to 10 seconds on each side in oil. Um, and I'll either have half a pound a week or a pound every two weeks. Seems to be a good amount for me um, and kind of aligns with what some of these people are recommending. I also try to have pasture-raised eggs once a week or so, you know, four eggs. I'm not doing the four raw egg yolks that uh, Paul Saladino or three or whatever it is has or, or rec recommends. I was doing that for some time, but I just think, again, it's, it's, it's unnecessary and um, I, I'd prefer to get more of my food from, from meat. Um, and I'm not supplementing with extra glycine for now. Um, I was doing that for a bit, as I said, but, um, it, I just, I, I find it hard to believe it's that much of an issue. There is some glycine in muscle meat and I'm, I think I'm going to take Paul Saladino's recommendation, which is I'm going to not supplement with it at all for, uh, you know, three to six months. And then I'm going to get some blood tests done. Um, things like glutathione and, and, um, uh, uh, I forget some of the other tests he recommends for, for seeing if, if this is thrown off, but um, he recommended some in my podcast with him. So folks can go check that out. So that's kind of nose to tail carnivore, what I've learned, what I've started to apply and where I currently think it stands. Next issue I want to cover, which is actually the thing I get asked about more than anything by my listeners is weight loss. So um, folks have heard me talk about this with almost every guest who's been on the show, but um, where I come down on calorie counting, protein and satiety and how it all relates to what you should do if you want to lose weight, control weight, improve body composition, etc. So for a long time, I was a strong believer in this protein to energy ratio and the protein leverage hypothesis, which I'll just describe very briefly because most listeners are probably familiar, but essentially uh, a lot of folks out there are, are sort of in this mindset, um, primarily Dr. Ted Naiman, but many people are influenced by him, like William Schufelt and the Keto Gains guys, Marty Kendall from Optimizing Nutrition and Dr. Kevin Stock, basically saying that your body eats food until it's satisfied its protein requirements. So if you're eating not enough protein or a diet that's higher in fat and or carbs, you will just eat much more calories to make up for the fact that you're not getting enough protein. And by increasing your, the amount of protein you eat, you'll stop eating at a much lower calorie amount and be satisfied. So Ted has taken this concept kind of to the extreme. I love Ted. I've learned so much from him. I think he's brilliant. But what he's done is sort of create these infographics and calculators which say, you know, what is the protein to energy ratio of a given food and how he defines that is grams of protein to grams of fat and carbs. So for instance, um, you know, something like a chicken breast with, uh, let's just, I, I'm not looking at actual data, but let's just call it 20 grams of protein, two grams of fat, zero carbs would be 10 to one. Um, or, or a ribeye steak, which is 20 grams of fat and 20 grams of protein would be one to one. And he would say, you know, if you want to lose weight, you probably have to eat foods that are higher than one to one. So more protein grams than fat and or carb grams. Um, and by just whenever you're trying to lose weight, ratcheting up the protein to energy ratio, that's the most effective way to lose weight. And so I used to think this was 
sort of a smarter and simpler approach than calorie counting or um, portion control. But I actually, the more I've thought about it and had conversations with people about it, the more it's made me really realize this is just another form of portion control and restriction and calorie counting. You're really just finding a simpler, less precise way to say, I'm going to try to trick my body into eating less calories. And I don't think calories in, calories out as a model is totally debunked. I mean, I've used it. I've lost weight on a high carb diet. I've lost weight on a carnivore diet, on a keto diet, all counting calories. But I'm coming around to the thought process that eating to satiety and finding a way to lose weight while doing that is the ultimate solution and where you want to be. And what's made me think this most recently is, um, I'll just name some names because I feel like I owe it to them, but then I'll explain the concept. So some great information on this is Tristan Haggard, Pride Mental Edge Health, recent interview with Amber O'Hearn, um, Josh Blackburn or Logical Links on Twitter um, has been doing an experiment with this and he spoke with Carnomad on YouTube, um, known as Guy in Austin on Twitter. He was on my podcast, Mike Davis. Um, Doug Wright has talked about this a lot on Twitter. Sh- Siobhan Huggins, um, another podcast guest. Other people would be great to, to follow regarding this are Carnivore Muscle on social media, um, Dr. Zofia Clemens from uh, Paleo Medicina. Michaela Peterson has also begun to talk about this. Um, Ash Simmons is actually one of the first people to openly talk about um, eating fat first and protein later. And then Philip Meese, most recently of the Carnivore Bar, has has come out talking a little bit about this. And a lot of them um, have basically been explaining that Nutrient density as, as a concept and as a calculation, this kind of gets back to the nose to tail carnivore piece, is solving for, you know, nutrient density is kind of defined as how can you get the most amount of nutrients for the least amount of calories? So a really nutrient poor food in terms of nutrient density would be like a piece of bread or um, a cupcake or a donut. Tons of calories, very few nutrients. High nutrient density is automatically super low calorie foods that have um, theoretically high nutrients, spinach, green vegetables, etc. The problem is when you take this concept to its logical conclusion, the most nutrient dense food is a multivitamin. And it's also neglecting the fact that calories can serve as nutrients in some ways in my mind. So if you think about fat and calories, those are essential parts of our reproductive health, of our hormone production. We need fat to produce cholesterol. We need fat to um, run our brain. We need fat for all types of essential bodily functions. And what nutrient dense, what nutrient density tells you is, sure, some fat is good. Maybe have you know some fat attached to your steak, whatever. But really, you should be prioritizing leaner protein, animal proteins, getting lots of green vegetables, etc. And the problem is, is that puts people in what I think is a suboptimal metabolic state. So let me talk a little bit about kind of the difference between being in a, what, what I'm now thinking is optimal, eating a higher fat carnivore diet, still, still fairly high in protein or, or moderate in protein versus trying this high protein, you know, arguably close to protein sparing modified fast or just higher protein than fat approach. When you're eating higher fat, you're more likely to be in ketosis. You're going to have all the positive metabolic effects of ketones, blunting hunger, making you more metabolically efficient, um, making you just feel better, making your brain function better, your muscles, your heart, all of your systems, your hormones. And it's really going to satisfy your body's requirements versus when you're in the high protein camp, you know, let's say you're eating 200 to 300 grams of protein and hundred grams of fat a day or less, the, the stomach will be full. The body will tell you, okay, I'm kind of done eating all this dry protein, but you're starving it of fat and you're relying on gluconeogenesis to kind of force protein into glucose for your energy because your body can't rely on just 
uh, a low amount of fat for energy. It'll mobilize some from your own fat stores, but it's also going to need to to produce more glucose to make up for the fact that you don't that you're not having a huge bolus of fat every day. That's that's going to be that the readily available f- fuel. So. I mean, in my experience and in all the people I just named and, you know, you can ask tons of chronic dieters, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel tired. You feel run down all the time. You feel cold. Your metabolism shuts down. All these problems come up. And I'm also starting to believe that, um, and, and Amber talks about this a little bit, you're, you're chronically kind of spiking your blood gu- glucose. Um, not a lot. Um, people have done experiments when they have giant amounts of protein, but your, your glucose does go up. And when you're having these high protein meals multiple times a day through super high protein, that's, that's going to make you hungry. And it's also going to make it harder for you to burn your own body fat. So that, that's kind of one of the major problems that I see with this higher protein approach. And then another great one that, um, uh, just kind of supports this that is on uh, these, this blog called The Scribble Pad by a brilliant woman named It's The Woo, or at least that's her, her handle. She talks about these certain hormones that uh, have to do with satiety, mainly CCK and ghrelin. Um, and after a meal, um, fat does a great job of using these hormones and making you feel full. But protein, on the other hand, actually makes you more hungry. I believe it upregulates ghrelin after a meal. So it's just a great example of how biochemically this, this can make things worse if you're just eating very high amounts of protein all the time. And then another thing that uh, Paleo Medicina and, the, and Dr. Zofia Clemens talks about in, in many of her interviews and shows is a lot of times they find people with the greatest indigestion on a protein, on a carnivore diet, which I think... Some people view as, oh man, I just had diarrhea, not a big deal. Like that doesn't have a lot to do with my body composition. I think it has everything to do with how your body functions and how you look because it's a sign of how well you're absorbing nutrients and and how well nutrients are passing through your system. Um, She says that oftentimes it's they're eating too much protein. They're eating way too much muscle meat, too many pounds. So I think really there's just a lot of upside to be had from eating a higher, higher fat approach. And, um, Amber and, uh, Doug Wright and, uh, Josh have coined this term, um, keto AF (laughs) and it doesn't stand for what you think it's keto animal foods. And so they've kind of come up with this term because, uh, what they were doing was close to, but not exactly the recommendations of the paleo medicina clinic, which they practice a two to one, two grams of fat per one gram of protein diet, um, along with a lot of other very specific recommendations around the amount of food, no coffee, no tea. Um, I may be getting some of this wrong, but, um, a certain amount of organ meats every week, etc. Um, keto AF as they're defining it is is a little bit more lenient. So they they don't want to call it the paleo ketogenic diet. There's also a trademark around that. So the keto animal fat diet, um, and folks can find out more about this on the keto animal fat subreddit, um, keto AF subreddit, excuse me. I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, really the recommendations are start with animal fat to satiety, then eat lean. Um, there's an optional goal of targeting two to one fat to protein by grams. Or visually, for folks who, who want to try this, it's about one part of pure fat to three parts of pure lean visually, if you're looking at the meat. And what's so interesting is eating the animal fat to satiety, then eating the lean. This is exactly what folks who have been doing this for decades, like Ash Simmons and the Anderson family, who thrive on fatty ribeyes, where if you look at them, they're almost exactly you know that one part of pure delicious fat on the outside of the ribeye to, to the pure lean, um, more throughout the inside. It's exactly what they thrive on. And it just makes so much sense to me that, um, you know, people just feel better on this long term. And, um, I think I'm, I'm can, I'm becoming more convinced that this is optimal and I'm going to personally give it a try. Um, some questions a lot of folks have are around kind of the sources of fat to lean, um, and I, I defer to, to Amber and 
uh, Josh and, and Doug and others on this, but generally I think they would say that rendered fats, um, so tallow, um, lard can give people trouble in high quantities, just, um, indigestion. So they recommend either getting fatty meats. I know Josh buys untrimmed brisket from Costco and it's actually so fatty that he combines that with, uh, with, um, chuck or, or really lean steaks. Um, another option is to use suet. Um, you can either have it raw or slightly cooked, um, or bone marrow. Um, again, either raw or slightly cooked. So, um, and then you can just combine that with some lean steaks. You can take kind of a frugal vor approach if you're like Josh and uh, just try to get you know cheap cuts um, and combine them. Or you can go the kind of deluxe version like the Anderson family and buy the fattiest untrimmed ribeyes, you know USDA choice or prime that you can find. Um, so I've done some early experience with this. I went a little bit crazy at first. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, I, I upped my fat a lot on kind of a refeed day and, um, I was doing it a lot of my calories too close to the end of the day. And, um, it made me really hot and I didn't sleep very well. So, um, I prematurely cut it off, but I, what I'll try to do going forward and what I've been doing for the last kind of week and a half is just moving from where I was, which was probably more of a one gram of fat to two grams of protein type ratio. And I was calorie counting for a bit and I actually did lose about 10 pounds of weight calorie counting and restricting. But again, my energy was not great and my mood suffered. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I've returned to more of a one-to-one, -one, one gram of fat per one gram of protein ratio. And I'm just going to gradually increase that over time um, and decrease my quantity of meat. So before when I was eating three, three and a half pounds of meat a day, but it was leaner. Now I'm eating more like two pounds of meat a day, maybe two point two and a quarter. And I'll gradually decrease that to a pound and a half, maybe even a pound if I'm adding enough fat to it. So that's my latest thinking on calorie counting, weight loss, protein, all that. Um, but you know, let me know if you have any questions on that and, and curious to hear other people's experiences or, or reactions to kind of these videos. Um, and interviews. So that is those topics. The next thing I wanted to cover briefly is meal timing. So meal timing, I think the long and short of it is it matters less than you think. I think it's generally good to have at least two meals a day. I say that because if you're eating one meal a day, um, longer than 16 to 18 hours fasting has been shown, um, to increase muscle protein breakdown. And I know a lot of these studies have not been in people on a carnivorous diet, so there might be greater amino acid availability, slower digestion of people who are carnivore. Um, but just based on the research that is available, it seems that around the 18 hour mark is when muscle protein breakdown starts to really pick up and then growth hormone um, starts to elevate. And a lot of people think this is great. Oh, my growth hormone is going up 3000% while I'm fasting, like there's no way I'm losing muscle. And that's kind of the argument that people like D uh, Dr. Jason Fung give, but really, um, at least what keto gains people, Luis Villasenor and, um, Tyler Cartwright and others, uh, mental Henselmans have talked about is really this elevation in growth hormone is focused on protecting your organs from breaking down, um, which is kind of scary to me. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to get into that state and I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage others to do it. So I think two meals a day, you know, breakfast and dinner is great. A lot of people naturally fall into that. If you prefer to have three meals a day, I think that's also totally fine. No huge advantage either way. Um, I tried, uh, recently to shift back my meals. Folks have known for a while that I talked about the importance of having breakfast and not fasting through, breakfast. Um, and I, I stole that kind of from Tristan Haggard of Primal Edge Health, uh, and Bill Lagakos of, um, calories proper. Um, they talk about how your cortisol elevates in the morning to wake you up, um, gradually. And it's a good idea to have a meal then in the morning to put your body back into a rest and digest state rather than have this 
super high cortisol and then a cup of coffee, which spikes your cortisol again. And you're basically running on adrenaline and putting your body into this fight or flight mode all morning. Um, it's better to have bigger meal earlier in the day. And then that way, if you finish cutting, cutting off your food earlier, um, you can still have a longer fasting period, you know, 12 to 14 hours or even more. Um, and you'll also sleep better because you're not digesting food. So recently I shifted that around and I said, Hey, I'm going to try having a big dinner again. I'm going to try working out in the afternoon because people think it's optimal to work out in the afternoon according to your circadian rhythm. And when, uh, testosterone peaks and certain things like that, um, I did great while I was cutting and calorie restricting. Um, I always sleep my best when I'm calorie restricting. I think it's because my body isn't burning off all the excess calories, and I'm also colder, which having a lower core body temperature helps you sleep. But um, as soon as I went back to normal calories and a normal amount of food, that large post-workout meal, you know, even the shift from 5 p.m. till 7 p.m. ish, um, made my sleep much worse. So it impacted my sleep. So I went from having kind of a 7:30 a.m. breakfast, 12 o'clock lunch, and a uh, five o'clock dinner to, um, you know, nine o'clock breakfast, 1 PM lunch and 6 PM or 7 PM dinner. And, uh, sleep got worse when I was at maintenance or slightly above maintenance calories. So my current thinking is shift the meal timing back to the morning. I'm probably going to cut back to actually two meals a day, just big breakfast. And then, um, a, a moderate to large, uh, lunch, stop eating around 3 PM. Um, and see how I do with that. So that's my thinking on meal timing. Uh, next topic is coffee. So coffee is something that was near and dear to my heart for a while. I was carnivore for two years while eating, while drinking coffee. And I seem to fare well on it. There are long-term carnivores who still seem to drink coffee and do fine, like Amber O'Hearn. Um, I went in depth with her on my podcast about coffee. So folks should definitely dig into that if they're curious. But couple of reasons why I think coffee is suboptimal and Dr. Paul Saladino um, has talked about this. One is it's very high in phytic acid and also oxalates. So those are two of the main plant compounds that um, people say to avoid and a good reason why vegetables might be screwing you up. So um, check out Dr. Georgia Eads posts on diagnosis diet all about problems with plant compounds and, and little shop of horrors and, and some of our information about uh, toxins and plants. The other thing to know about coffee is it's highly acidic and that can cause intestinal distress for a lot of people. So people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBS, um, they'll often find that giving up coffee just reduces their inflammation, reduces their symptoms so much. Um, it's, it's like night and day. Um, the other problems with coffee, I've talked about this before, but it raises adrenaline and cortisol, um, especially if you're having it later in the day, but not even necessarily. It disrupts your circadian rhythm. It impacts your sleep. And so what I've done is I've switched to one caffeine pill um, in the morning, uh, 200 milligrams, so not very much. Um, that's less than the size of kind of a medium coffee from Starbucks uh, that most people would get. And it's not ideal. I, I, th I think it'd probably still be better to give up the caffeine entirely, but um, I seem to be doing way better with that than, than I was with coffee. It's so convenient. It's so cheap. Like a bottle of 100 caffeine pills is like $3 on Amazon. Um, and, you know, there's no indigestion. There's less of an energy crash. There's no shakiness. It's just like smooth feeling good energy, um, almost right after I take it and throughout the whole morning and there's no crash at, at the end of the morning or in the afternoon. So I, I'm really enjoying the caffeine pills, easy to travel with. You don't have to go find coffee when you're, uh, traveling or, or away. Um, you know, I, d I do miss the ritual of coffee. Um, not as much as some people say they do. I think everyone's a coffee addict and this is probably a super contentious topic, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're willing to give it a try, try, try the caffeine pills. Maybe that's a way to, to experiment without having to go cold Turkey on coffee entirely. And, you know, um, completely miss out on caffeine and have to go through caffeine withdrawals. So that's coffee. Um, the last 
two quick topics I want to cover is one is whey and dairy. So I've been doing some experiments with whey protein, um, or I had been over the last few months, or I would have a whey protein shake either in the morning, if I would do an early morning fasted workout, or um, right before my workout. The reason I was doing it is to have amino acids readily available in my blood for when I did resistance training, because um, people like Menno Henselmans and uh, the folks over at Keto Gains and Rob Wolf have advocated it's the pre-workout uh, protein that matters way more than the post because it actually takes time to digest and have those amino acids available to stop muscle protein breakdown and increase muscle protein synthesis. So I was totally bought into that. I didn't ha- notice any um, increase in intestinal distress, increase in inflammation, weight gain, all these symptoms that some people have with protein powders. And I was using a whey protein isolate. I think it's now Sports is the brand, super plain no fillers, no flavoring at all. Um, and I felt fine. I didn't feel a substantial increase in hunger or anything like that, but I've since stopped it. And, um, a few people have kind of convinced me of this. One is, um, Dr. Kevin stock. Uh, another is Don Matez of, of hyper, the hyper carnivore book, which I absolutely love. Um, and then, uh, you know, others like Sean Baker and everyone in the zeroing in on health and, and zero carb community pretty much opposed to protein powders. And so there's a few reasons I've stopped it. One is it's a refined product. I know that's kind of a reductionist argument um, and an overgeneralization, but it is really refined and not the way we would be getting those nutrients in it from an animal. Uh, second is, um, you know, it can have GI impacts for a lot of people continuing to ingest dairy that way. Uh, another is it can have hunger disruption effects and you know, some people would say, oh yeah, whey, whey will disrupt your hunger. It'll make you less hungry. It's been shown to do that in a lot of experiments. And I would say one, all those experiments are funded by the dairy industry. <laughs> and two, I, per my earlier discussion on, um, you know, satiety and nutrient density, I'm done with trying to trick my body into being satisfied. I want my body to be satisfied on um, calorie rich, um, plentiful, uh, fat rich foods and, um, you know, adding on that excess bolus of protein, um, whether it makes me satisfied or not, I think may be the wrong approach. So that's my overview of kind of way. And then other dairy, I'm really still not sure. There are folks, um, like Don Matez who say, um, you know, it can be beneficial. Frank Tufano has said in some of his videos, it may be positive for vitamins like vitamin K. Um, but I think both of them acknowledge that dairy does seem to cause inflammation and weight gain and sometimes really adverse reactions in certain individuals. So for now, I think it's not ideal. Um, I know that sources matter a lot. You can get raw dairy, um, something like different grades of dairy. I don't know exactly what those are. Um, but there seems to be a high degree of individual variances and tolerances. I keep my very intake, dairy intake extremely minimal. Um, I probably haven't had any other than the way in the last six months and the way I was only doing for about a month or two, but that's kind of where I stand on dairy. I'm keeping an open mind about it as I am with all these topics, but that's kind of how I think about that. Uh, last quick one is electrolytes. Um, so a lot of people, another contentious topic, do you salt your food? Do you not salt your food? Do we need magnesium, potassium, um, or is it all in the meat and we'll get it? Um, I have, and some of this comes out of Rob Wolf and Keto Gains, Luis Via Senor, and Tyler Cartwright. I'm I'm still having so such a high uh, electrolyte consumption personally, and I feel great with that. I have it, you know, in the morning when I wake up. I have it before I go to the sauna. I have it after a workout. I'll have you know usually a teaspoon of sodium or, or, or salt, usually Redmond real salt. I I shake some of the um, new salt, uh, potassium in, in my mouth and I'll, I'll swallow that. And I also supplement with magnesium sometimes before bed, um, most nights. And, um, I'm also trying the LM, LM, LMNT packets from keto gains, which are a mix of, uh, sodium, potassium, and magnesium in, in a good ratio. So I think electrolytes, um, are good. Um, 
especially when getting adapted to carnivore or ketogenic diets. They're also great when you're fasting for extended periods of time, which I'm generally not a fan of. But um, I've just personally been experimenting with really high electrolytes lately, and uh, I felt really good with it. I I say I've even felt better than when I was just salting my food to taste. So I don't know if it's ideal. Um, a lot of people would say you're it's too delicate a balance and you're throwing things off and you'll be low on things like calcium or whatever, but, uh, I'm not convinced either way. I'm, I'm keeping an open mind. So, you know, give some thought to electrolytes. Let me know what you think. So that's, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening today. I really appreciate it. I don't take your time for granted. Um, again, if you've enjoyed the show, I really appreciate you becoming a patron on patreon.com slash carnivore cast. Um, it's just going to help in our mission to, you know, get as many people healthy as possible, make them question their existing dietary dogma and be a little bit aware, more aware of, of what can be accomplished through something like a carnivore diet. Um, if you don't use Patreon again, I'm also on PayPal, paypal.me slash carnivorecast. Really appreciate it. Um, it means a lot to me. And otherwise you can find me on social media at carnivorecast across Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter until next time. Keep it carnivore.